Black Lives Matter activists are back in the news after confronting Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail. Following a campaign event in New Hampshire, a group of Black Lives Matter activists from Massachusetts met with Clinton. What followed was a 16-minute conversation, during which the activists pressed Clinton to address her support of the crime bill that her husband, former President Bill Clinton, signed into law in 1994. That legislation led to the largest increases in federal and state prison inmates of any president in American history. Uh, Hillary Clinton had lobbied heavily for uh, lawmakers to pass the crime bill, which included $9.7 billion in prison funding and tougher sentencing provisions. Speaking before the annual Women in Policing Conference in 1994, Hillary Clinton said, quote, We need more police. We need more and tougher prison sentences for repeat offenders. The three strikes and you're out for violent offenders has to be part of the plan. We need more prisons to keep violent offenders for as long as it takes to keep them off the street, she said. Well, in a moment, we'll be joined by two of the Black Lives Matters activists who talked with Hillary Clinton last week. But first, let's talk, uh, let's turn to a part of their exchange. It begins with Denesha Yancey of Black Lives Matter Boston. That your, you and your family have been personally and politically responsible um, for policies that have caused health and human services disasters in impoverished communities of color through the domestic and international war on drugs um, that you championed as First Lady, Senator, and Secretary of State. Um, and so I just want to know how you feel about your role in that violence um, and how you plan to reverse it. Well, you know, I, I feel strongly, which is why I had this town hall uh, today, and uh, is, you know, the questions and the comments from people uh, illustrated. There's a lot of concern that we need to rethink and redo what we did in response to a different set of problems. And, you know, in life, in politics, in government, you name it, you got to constantly be asking yourself, is this working, is it not? And if it's not, what do we do better? And that's what I'm trying to do now. On, on drugs, on mass incarceration, on um, um, police behavior and criminal justice reform. Because I do think that there was a different set of concerns back in the 80s and the early 90s. And um, now I believe we have to look at the world as it is today and try to figure out what will work now. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's what I intend to do as president. Yeah, and I would offer that it didn't work then either, mm -hmm. um, and that those policies were actually extensions of white supremacist violence against communities of color. And so I, I just think I want to hear a little bit about that, about the, well, the fact sure. that actually while those policies yeah. were being enacted, they were ripping apart families and yeah. actually causing death. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with you. I'm not sure I disagree that any kind of government action often has uh, consequences. And certainly uh, the war on drugs, which you know, started back in the 80s, right, um, has had consequences. Uh, increasing um, penalties for crime and three strikes in your eye and all of those uh, kinds of actions have had consequences. But it's important to remember, and I certainly remember, that you know there was a very serious um, you know crime uh, wave that was impacting primarily uh, communities of color mm -hmm. and poor people. Maritime. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton responding to a question posed by Denesha Yancey of Black Lives Matter Boston after a campaign event in New Hampshire last week. Well, Denesha joins us now here in New York, along with Julius Jones of Black Lives Matter Worcester, who also questioned Clinton about her criminal justice record. Welcome to Democracy Now! In a moment, we're going to play a longer part of the encounter you both had. But, Denesha, explain the scene. Um, how did you meet up with Hillary Clinton? You, unlike other Black Lives Matter moments in presidential campaign history of the last few months, where people interrupted public mm -hmm. events, you were actually brought to her privately? Yeah, so we uh, we went to New Hampshire with the intention of confronting Hillary Clinton in the public forum. There was a forum she was hosting on substance abuse. Unfortunately, when we got there, we were told that we couldn't come inside. Um, but. Uh, Dan Marica actually recognized me well, and because started, it was crowded. You that that's the reason that we were given was capacity, um, and so he was tweeting that we weren't able to get in, and then someone came. This out. is a reporter from CNN. Yes. 
Um, and so someone came out and invited us into an overflow room where we could actually watch the, the forum. Um, and then one of her staffers came in and said, uh, you know, we could offer you a couple of minutes with her. And we said, absolutely, so that we could ask her the questions that we had. And did she know you were filming her? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, she did. And were you surprised that the conversation, uh, Julius, lasted as long as it did? Yeah, it was it was actually kind of shocking. Um, I think I think she was taking the opportunity to to give us enough time and space to satisfy the concerns of that were raised by us not being let in. Mm -hmm. It felt as if um, <coughs> you know it was strategic on on the campaign's part, and, and it was probably pretty smart that they that they didn't let the story get out that um, we were shut out of the meeting. But um, I think what I think the direction that the conversation went in was probably unexpected by by her in the mm -hmm. campaign and it was a very candid open and and honest and um frank hillary clinton too mm -hmm. well talk about Denisha um before we go into the question um the next question that julius asks uh what you the issues you were raising in this first encounter with her that we just played well, we wanted to hear from her a personal reflection on her participation in promoting uh, policies through the war on drugs um, that have that have increased our mass incarceration situation that we're in today. Um, that Hillary Clinton and the Clintons hold a unique space in our in our country's politics, um, and so to be at a, a having a forum on substance abuse and to not recognize her own uh, role in in not you know, in the war on drugs that has actually been a war on drug users, um, we felt like we really needed to hold her accountable to that history. And in what capacity um, was she responsible? Uh, talk about her history, how you hold her responsible. Well, she advocated for, as FLOTUS and as senator, for policies that have, that have increased the, the, the penalties for, for minor drug offenses and things like that. Um, back in 94, uh, there was uh, $17 billion divested from HUD, from public housing, and $19 billion put into to prison construction. And so with, with situations like that that we've seen her publicly support, uh, we really wanted to hear from her what has changed um, in her that she would not continue to, to promote practices like that. And how do you respond to folks who say that, well, the, the Black Lives Matter now has been confronting several Democratic candidates, but the Republican candidates, of which there are many more, uh, mm -hmm. have largely been so far unscathed on questions of answering their, their, their policy issues in terms of the, the black community and, and of police violence and in mass incarceration? Yeah. The, well, every presidential candidate should expect to hear from us and expect to be held accountable. Um, it's actually a, a, a practice called power mapping, where um, it's similar to lobbying, where you actually actually uh, map who's closest to you on the issue and go to those folks first in order to, to force them to articulate their stance and then hold them accountable to it. Uh, so this movement is very strategic, uh, and that's what we've been doing. We want to turn to the next part of the interaction. Um, um, talk about how long you had with her. There were um, campaign staffers around, is that right? Yeah, it was a uh, it was a room that was probably full of um, twenty people. There were five folks with us and fifteen with her, and then the the, the four or five people that you see on camera. There was probably another uh, six on either side of the of the person who was uh, filming, and uh, it was it was a decent amount of time. It was like fifteen minutes. It felt like it. It felt like it lasted forever. So this is Julius Jones um, questioning Hillary Clinton. The truth is that there's an extremely long history of unfortunate government practices that don't work, that particularly affect black people mm -hmm. and black families. Mm -hmm. And until we as a country, and then the person who's in the seat that you see, mm -hmm. actually addresses the anti-blackness current mm -hmm. that is America's first drug. We're in a meeting about drugs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. America's first drug is free black labor mm -hmm. and turning black bodies into profit. Mm -hmm. And the mass incarceration system mirrors <coughs> an awful lot like the prison, the prison plantation system. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's a similar thread, mm -hmm. right? And until someone takes that message and speaks that truth, to white people in this country so that we can actually take on anti-blackness as a founding problem in this country. I don't believe that there's going to be a solution. And I, I genuinely want to know, 
you and your family mm -hmm. have been, in no uncertain way, partially responsible for it. It's more than most, right? Now, the, there may have been unintended consequences, but now that you understand the consequences, what in your heart has changed that's going to change the direction of this country? Mm. Like, what in you, like, not your platform, mm -hmm. not, not what you're supposed to say, like, how do you actually feel that's different than you did before? Like, what were the mistakes, and how can those mistakes that you made be lessons for all of America? for a moment of reflection on how we treat black people mm -hmm. in this country. Your analysis is totally fair. It's historically fair, it's psychologically fair, it's economically fair. But you're going to have to come together as a movement and say, here's what we want done about it. Because you can get lip service from as many white people as you can pack into Yankee Stadium and. Mm -hmm a million more like it, we're going to say, oh, we get it, we get it, we're going to be nicer, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. That's not enough, at least right. in my book. That's not how I see mm -hmm. politics. So the consciousness raising, the advocacy, the passion, the youth of your movement is so critical. But now all I'm suggesting is, even for us sinners, find some common ground on agendas that can make a difference right here and now in people's lives. And that's what I would love to, you know, have your thoughts about, uh, because that's what I'm trying to figure out how to do. So yeah, deal with mass incarceration. I don't, it's not just an economic issue, although I grant you some people see it like that. But it's more than that. I think there is a sense like, you know, low level offenders, disparity in treatment, we gotta do something about that. Um, I think that a lot of the issues about housing and about, uh, you know, job opportunities, ban the box, a lot of these things, let's get an agenda that addresses as much of the problem as we can. Because then you can be for something, in addition to getting people to have to admit that they're part of a long history in our country of, you know, either, you know, pr pr uh, proposing, supporting, condoning uh, discrimination, uh, segregation, et cetera. Now, what do we do next? And, and that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out in my campaign. So that's what I'm doing. Madam Secretary, Thank you. We really have to go. Thank you. The, the piece that's most important, and I, I, I stand here in your space, and I say this as respectfully as I can, but if you don't tell black people what we need to do, then we won't tell you all what you need to do. Well, I'm not telling you. I'm just telling you to tell what me. I, what I mean to say yeah. is that this is and has always been a white problem of violence. It's not, there's, there's not much that we can do to stop the violence against us. Well, if, if that is a conversation that I push okay, back. Okay, I understand, and, I understand what you're saying. And also respectfully, yeah. respectfully. Well, respectfully, if that is your position, then I will talk only to white people about how we are going to deal with that's the very I mean. real that's problems. That's not what I mean, that's not what I mean. No. But like what I'm saying is you, you what you just said mm -hmm. was a form of victim blaming. And you were saying that what the Black Lives Matter movement needs yeah. to do to change white hearts is no, I'm not talking about, I, Look, change. I don't believe you change hearts. I believe you change laws, you change allocation of resources, you change the way systems operate. You're not going to change every heart. You're not. But at the end of the day, we can do a whole lot to change some hearts and change some systems and create more opportunities for people who deserve to have them to live up to their own God-given potential, to live safely without fear of violence in their own communities, to have a decent school, to have a decent house, to have a decent future. So we can do it one of many ways. You know, you can keep the movement going, which you have started, and through it, you may actually change some hearts. But if that's all that happens, we'll be back here in 10 years having the same conversation. That's Julius Jones speaking with Hillary Clinton and Denasia Yancey, as well, of the Black Lives Matter movement, Boston and Worcester. They went up to Keene, New Hampshire. She was holding a forum on substance abuse. And they were actually brought to her backstage afterwards. Were you satisfied, Julius, with her answer to you? I think we got to her in a way that, that made it feel like the trip was worth it. Uh, the content of the answer I was not satisfied with, because Hillary Clinton 
gave an answer that I might expect in a normal conversation that I have with your everyday liberal person who is ducking the personal responsibility and just trying to focus on the solution. And that's something that I expect in everyday conversation when I, when I engage with people in this idea. But when it comes to Hillary Clinton and the Clintons in general, they, they not only occupy a unique space in, in how they feel, but they, they are directly responsible for the greatest increase in the prison population under any president. And for her to, to be confronted with this idea and then immediate, immediately say that the movement needs to solve this problem. And then in the backdrop, what she's not saying is what would be in parentheses would be that I created, mm -hmm. like the problem that the Clintons created and perpetuated this long droning history of anti-blackness in the United States. And her visceral reaction, I think, was indicative of how she felt. And I think it was indicative of how perhaps in her own racial introspection, it was the first time that it had really occurred to her like that, because it was like, it was a very emotional reaction, more emotional than I think we've seen Hillary. No, I think it's one of the more uh, candid uh, moments in the presidential campaign uh, so far of any of the candidates to, to get her to have to respond uh, off her regular message or her prepared notes and have to have an interchange and a back and forth on a, on a subject that she clearly did not relish having, but was also cl uh, clearly affected or listening to what you had to say. So I, I, you know, I congratulate you for being able to raise those issues and, uh, and also, thankfully, that there was a a video uh, to let other people see what actually happened. Um, I wanted to go back and get your comment on the other uh, times that Black Lives Matter have engaged with the Democratic presidential candidates. Earlier this month, two Black Lives Matter activists, Marissa Johnson and Mara Williford, shut down an appearance in Seattle by presidential candidate Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. <laughs> After some negotiation amidst a chorus of boos from the crowd, Marissa Johnson addressed the crowd and held a four-and-a-half-minute moment of silence for Michael Brown. One minute for each hour, he lay on the street in Ferguson after being gunned down by a police officer August 9, 2014, just over a year ago. Johnson then referenced the confrontation that Black Lives Matter activists had with Sanders and another Democratic presidential candidate, former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, earlier this summer at the Netroots Nation conference in Phoenix. If you believe that black lives matter, as you say you do, then you will join us now in holding Bernie Sanders accountable specifically for his actions. Bernie, you were confronted, you were, co you were confronted at that roots by black women who said black lives matter, and you have yet to apologize. Senator Sanders appeared on Meet the Press Sunday and spoke to reports that his campaign has apologized for taking so long to reach out to Black Lives Matter activists. Well, that was sent out by a staffer, not by me. Look, we are reaching out to all kinds of groups. Absolutely. I met with folks at Black Lives Matter. We're reaching out to Latino groups. We're reaching out to the unions. We're fighting to expand Social Security, and we're reaching out to senior groups. We're reaching out to health care groups because we believe that everybody in America is entitled to health care. We're reaching out to everybody. But on this issue of Black Lives Matter, let me be very clear. The issue that they are raising is a very, very important issue. There's no candidate for president who will be stronger in fighting against institutional racism and, by the way, reforming a broken criminal justice system. Chuck, we have more people in jail in the United States of America than any other country on earth. And we need real changes. We need to do away with the militarization of local police departments. We need to do away with minimum sentencing. We need education and jobs for our young people rather than jails and incarceration. I understand that, but uh, you said a staffer put it out, but uh, an apolo you felt an apology was necessary? No, I, I don't. I think we're going to be working with all groups. This was sent out without my knowledge. Fair enough.
And that was Chuck Todd of uh, Meet the Press speaking with uh, Senator Sanders. Um, uh, Julius Jones, your response to Sanders, um, uh, the interruptions and the questioning of him, do you feel he's responded adequately? I feel like his addition of uh, racial justice to his platform has been a good step in the right direction. Uh, what what he's what he's asked folks to do is to is to be patient with him and to uh, to trust that he will be the the best candidate to advance this type of agenda. And I think that even he, who is arguably on the on the cutting edge of this issue, does not understand the emergency, the urgency that 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 we're in in the struggle, because it's not just a uh, item on a long list of agendas in the United States for most of us. It's our families being devastated in the slow form through poverty, the loaded gun that is poverty at the black community's head. It's uh, faster in the prison, like with families who are broken up by their family members being in prison. And then it's the rapid, violent version in police brutality. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked the Counted Project, who is keeping track of police murders police killings in the United States is up to 731. It's on pace to topple a thousand. And proportionally, it's disproportionately against black people. We have live statistics that are showing the urgency of this unlike ever before. And Bernie Sanders is not treating it justly. I wanted to ask uh, uh, the uh, we've been talking about the presidential candidates. What about the sitting president and his changes in the last uh, uh, year or two in addressing some of the issues of mass incarceration and and an unju unjust uh, justice system? Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, his policies? I think that uh, he, he needs to be held just as accountable as as anyone. Uh, seeking or in this office, right? Um, and and so right now we are focused on this presidential uh, race, um, but absolutely I, folks have raised the, that concern and I think that he doesn't get off either. Um, no no president of the United States has, has ever uh, stood for black lives in a in a, a strong and, and effective way because, I mean, we're in the situation that we're in now, right? Finally, how you ended up founding Black Lives Matter chapter in Boston and you, uh, Julius, representing Black Lives Matter in Worcester, Massachusetts? Uh, it was through the Black Lives Matter's ride to Ferguson uh, last year in August of 2014. Mike Brown was killed on August 9th, and we were down in Ferguson by uh, August 29th. Um, and we were down there to support the community, to, to raise the issue, and to bring strategy back home. So that's what we did in founding the chapter in Boston. And Julius? Yes, in, in Worcester, I went to Ferguson a little bit before the, the nationwide call. And uh, then many months later, I uh, was doing some organizing work in Worcester with, uh, with a wonderful group and uh, decided to attempt to bring the, the national energy of BLM to Worcester. Well, we thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Denisha Yancey and Julius Jones, activists with Black Lives Matter. You can go to our website, especially for radio listeners, and you can see the interaction uh, between the Black Lives Matter activists in New Hampshire with Hillary Clinton. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we look at Donald Trump and particularly his taking on birthright, um, the issue of birthright. Should the Constitution be changed? and how he's affecting other presidential candidates. Stay with us.